So uh, my name is Dr. Jeff Chen. I'm the director of the new UCLA Cannabis Research Initiative, and we're one of the first academic programs in the world focused on the study of cannabis and cannabinoids. So Doc, what's actually in cannabis? So cannabis contains hundreds of compounds. Uh, the one compound that has been most widely studied and known about is tetrahydrocannabinol, THC. And this compound is responsible for the psychoactive properties of cannabis that have been well known. But there's actually over a hundred different cannabinoids, right? These are molecules that are relatively unique to the cannabis plant. So in addition to THC, there's other cannabinoids like CBD, which is the second most abundant cannabinoid in cannabis, as well as cannabinoids like CBN, CBC, CBG. In addition to the cannabinoids, you have other compounds in cannabis such as terpenes, which we know have physiologic properties. Um, and in addition to that, there's also uh, certain fatty acids and you can even find um, flavonoids in cannabis as well. So there's a whole mix of compounds in this plant. So Doc, what is the history of evidence of utility for cannabis in medicine? So, you know, in addition to the historical context of cannabis use, even today, right now, we have FDA approved medications based on cannabinoids. So ever since the 1980s, we've had Marinol in America, which is synthetic THC, and it's approved for uh, na uh, nausea induced by chemotherapy, as well as anorexia in patients who have AIDS, for example. In Europe, they also have something called Sativex, which is a combination of THC and CBD that is approved there for multiple sclerosis. And here in the US, we're in very late stage FDA clinical trials for a drug called Epidiolex, which is essentially purified CBD for uh, pediatric epilepsy. So there are uh, FDA approved versions and medications of the same compounds that are found in cannabis. It's just strange that cannabis today remains a schedule and drug in the US, which heavily restricts research as well as limits the amount of funding that can go towards therapeutic research in the cannabis. So how do cannabinoids actually work inside the body? What's the mechanism? So we went hunting and it was in the early 90s that we finally cloned the cannabinoid receptor. Um, and, that's, and then we realized there's multiple subtypes of these receptors. So there's the CB1 receptor, which is present mainly in the brain. And then there's a CB2 receptor, which is mainly present on immune cells. And, but in fact, they're also distributed widely throughout the body. They're found on our liver cells, fat cells, muscle cells, bone tissue. Um, so it's distributed throughout our body and it's not just a neurotransmitter, although most its predominant function is still uh, neurotransmission and it's still most concentrated in the brain. What are the functions of the endocannabinoid system? So the endocannabinoid system, first off, it's a very primitive system. So we think it evolved over 500 million years ago. So it's, it's as old as our endogenous opiate system. And the functions are also quite broad. So it's everything from mood, memory, sleep, the pain response, the stress response, uh, immune function, reproductive function, energy metabolism. And we're finding the endocannabinoid system is even implicated, uh, it's very critical in, in embryology and development. And we find that within just a few days of embryonic uh, life that they already start expressing CB1 receptors. And interestingly, uh, breast milk is actually very abundant in endocannabinoids. So this is a, a physiologic, this is a, an important physiologic system in our body. Um, Endocannabinoids are arguably one of the most widespread and versatile signaling molecules we have in our bodies. And this system is not just present in humans, it's preserved across all vertebrates. So mammals, fish, birds, uh, reptiles, they all have endocannabinoid systems. What are some of the other functions of the endocannabinoid system that our viewers might be interested in knowing about? So if you had to sum up the function of the endocannabinoid system in one word, it would be homeostasis. And the maintenance of a stable environment despite external stressors and changes in the environment. So let's get into the mechanism. What are some of the components of the endocannabinoid system? So you have the uh, endogenous cannabinoid receptors, the CB1 and CB2 receptors. You have the endogenous cannabinoids, the endocannabinoids. So you have uh, anandamide uh, and 2-AG. And then you have the enzymes that break down these endocannabinoids. So fatty acid amide hydrolase and uh, monoacyl glycerol. And so these are things that break down endocannabinoids in the synaptic cleft. So the CB1 receptor is uh, the most abundant G-coupled protein receptor in the 
in the mammalian brain. It's most heavily concentrated in areas like the hippocampus and the basal ganglia and the cerebellum. But again, we're also finding that the CB1 receptor is present in other cells throughout the body, uh, whether it's cells in our liver, fat, bone, skeletal muscle. Um, and in contrast, the CB2 receptor we find is predominantly in our immune cells. So whether it's leukocytes circulating through our blood or in the microglia, the white blood cells of the brain. But again, the CB2 receptor is also found in cells of, in, the, in the bone, heart tissue, lung tissue, liver tissue, and our reproductive organs as well. So the endocannabinoids are, classically you can think of them as neurotransmitters, but you also find that they're circulating throughout the blood in the body. And uh, endocannabinoids are, the, the precursors to endocannabinoids are omega fatty acids. And you find that when you, when you supplement uh, omega fatty acids into your diet, you do see a boost in endocannabinoid levels in the brain. So to follow on from that, how does endocannabinoid signaling work? So this might be easier if I show you a diagram to kind of walk you through how endocannabinoid signaling works. So if you take a look at picture A, uh, you have a presynaptic uh, neuron and it's showing the receptors on the post uh, synaptic neuron. And so as the action potential travels down the neuron, it's going to trigger uh, these, uh, these voltage-gated calcium channels. Um, you're going to have an influx of calcium, and it's going to release, in this example, uh, a neurotransmitter like glutamate, an excitatory neurotransmitter. Glutamate is going to bind to its downstream receptors, which are going to then open calcium channels on the postsynaptic neuron, and then the action potential will continue to propagate. So that's Classically, how we're going to think of this uh, neurotransmitter example. Now, in picture B, when there's uh, endocannabinoids involved in the picture, here's what happens. So the post, uh, the action potential travels down the presynaptic cell. Um, glutamate is released, and what's happening is, in addition to triggering calcium influx in the postsynaptic cell, you also have on-demand synthesis of endocannabinoids. Again, taken from uh, the fatty acids that are actually sitting uh, in the cell membrane, you have on-demand synthesis of endocannabinoids. And these endocannabinoids travel in a retrograde fashion, and they travel across the synaptic cleft back to the presynaptic cell. And that's where the CB1 receptor resides. And when they activate the CB1 receptor, you actually uh, attenuate the influx of calcium. So this is a way for the postsynaptic cell to, uh, to have a protective measure against uh, too much excitation, for example, in this case. So having this auto-protective negative feedback mechanism. So this is very different to how typical neurotransmitters work. And the other thing that's interesting to note is that uh, classic neurotransmitters are uh, water soluble. And so they're made beforehand and stored in vesicles. Like in this diagram, we see glutamate is stored in vesicles and released on demand. Uh, endocannabinoids being lipid soluble, you can't really store them in vesicles as readily. They'll just kind of float out. So they're synthesized on demand, released on demand, travel in a retrograde fashion, and afterwards they're degraded by these enzymes like FAAH, which degrades anandamide, um, or MAGL, which degrades 2-AG. So the obvious follow-up question from there is, how do the cannabinoids in cannabis actually interact with that system? So it turns out that uh, THC is a partial agonist. It's not a full agonist. It's a partial agonist at both the CB1 and the CB2 receptor. Um, in contrast, CBD doesn't really seem to have much activity at either one of those receptors. And so CBD is an interesting molecule in that sense. And we think that some of the ways that CBD is actually exerting its effect, well, one way, we think that it actually inhibits the enzyme FAAH. So by inhibiting the enzyme that breaks down endocannabinoids, CBD is actually boosting levels of certain endocannabinoids like anandamide. Um, CBD is also targeting non-cannabinoid receptors like serotonin receptors, um, vanilloid receptors, as well as being a allosteric modulator at the cannabinoid receptor. So not being an agonist, but more of an allosteric modulator. And we're actually finding that it appears that, for example, that CBD is a negative allosteric modulator at the CB1 receptor. And that's how it's actually, it might be able to actually attenuate the psychoactivity of THC when given in combination with THC. What do you see as the sort of therapeutic potential for the endocannabinoid system?
What we're actually finding is that in an incredibly wide variety of pathologic states that the dysregulation of the endocannabinoid system is implicated. So if you're taking a look at um, CNS diseases, so certain neurodegenerative diseases, we're finding that the uh, endocannabinoid system could be a therapeutic target, all the way from neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's to uh, mood disorders like depression or anxiety to even schizophrenia. Uh, you're finding that it looks like low levels of anandamide might actually be contributing to schizophrenia. And in fact, when you uh, it appears that there's one human study where they actually gave CBD and have found that um, it was actually able to treat the psychosis of schizophrenia and they believe that the mechanism is the CBD is boosting anandamide levels. Uh, we're also finding that um, the, uh, the endocannabinoid system could be a therapeutic target for cardiovascular disorders, liver diseases, um, inflammatory uh, bowel disorders, um, all the way to uh, being implicated in obesity and diabetes. Um, implicated in certain bone disorders like osteoporosis and implicated in cancer as well, um, as well as autoimmune disorders. Um, and so you can see that targeting endocannabinoid system, it's, it's a wide new area for drug development. And it's interesting that right now we don't really have many drugs that target the endocannabinoid system. Like we said, we have Marinol and we have Sativex. Um, and actually there was a drug that was targeting the endocannabinoid system called Ramonabant. And it was designed to uh, actually block the CB1 receptor because the CB1 receptor, when stimulated, increases appetite and fat storage. And so it was designed to block the CB1 receptor. And it did work, right? It, it decreased um, appetite and it, it, it uh, led to weight loss. But it was pulled from the market because it found that it also r significantly increased rates of depression and suicide. So this is a very complicated system. Um, and, you know, we're actively trying to do tar targeted drug development, but we have to be very careful about how we approach it as evidenced by the kind of case of Ramanaban. Where do you see the money for that research coming from? You know, at, at least tr traditionally, there's been very little funding for therapeutic research into cannabis, right? So here in the U.S., Cannabis is a Schedule One drug, which means that it has no accepted medical use and high potential for abuse. So it's lumped together with drugs like heroin or LSD. And so that creates significant research barriers. You know, cannabis is arguably the single hardest compound to study in America because of all these layers of approval you have to go through, as well as you're kind of limited in where you can even get cannabis to use in your studies. And moreover, because it's a Schedule One drug, you, you can't really get federal funding for therapeutic research. You can get federal funding for research into the harm and abuse potential, but not really therapeutic research. Is there any improvement in that with, you know, states uh, changing the way that it's regulated in their state? Yeah, so, you know, despite a majority of U.S. states having either legal medical or legal recreational cannabis, the federal laws are still the same. Um, as a university, there are actually, I can, from my office, I can see dispensaries in Westwood, but we're not allowed to use that product in our studies. So regardless of what California has done or will do with cannabis, we still are, st we still have to abide by those same federal measures that haven't changed since the 1970s. So half a century, we're still working under those rules and regulations, unfortunately. So one question we've had come up is how do you modulate the endocannabinoid activity? Um, so, you know, we talked about uh, exogenous cannabinoids, things like phytocannabinoids that might modulate endocannabinoid system activity. There's also non-cannabinoids that also modulate endocannabinoid system activity. So beta caryophylline, which is present in cannabis, but it's also present in black pepper. That's a CB2 agonist, interestingly. Um, there's also lifestyle modifications that we find can change endocannabinoid system activity. So we're finding that after exercise, uh, you do boost uh, endocannabinoid system levels. And I think there's more and more evidence now that the this runner's high that we've been talking about might be more due to endocannabinoids than the release of endorphins, right, our, our endogenous opiates. Um, it also appears that there's other um, pharmaceutical, or other drugs in general, pharmacologic drugs, things like non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, things like ibuprofen, we find it actually boosts 
endocannabinoid levels. So it, it could be that um, that's one of the mechanisms that these uh, comp uh, that things like ibuprofen are able to exert some of their effects. And lastly, we said diet. So things like um, intake of omega fatty acids have been shown to boost endocannabinoid levels. So Doc, you've obviously got an amazing position here at UCLA to be able to make significant impact in this industry. Uh, what is going to be your research priority and your focus at UCLA? I would say that it would be the use of cannabis or its cannabinoids um, for their opioid sparing properties. And so it's well known that America is in crisis right now with this opioid epidemic. It's the worst this country has ever seen. Um, there you have an opioid overdose every 15 minutes. So since we started this interview, an American has died from an opioid overdose and it's not slowing down. Um, and in fact, this epidemic is so profound that it's actually bending the life expectancy curve of our country. So life expectancy in this country has been climbing every single year for the last quarter century. And over the last year, it's actually fallen. Um, and so that's how powerful this epidemic is. And so with, with cannabis and the compounds within it, we know that it's useful for pain and specifically chronic pain. Um, and in fact, the National Academy of Sciences, uh, Medicine and Engineering came out with a landmark review and they stated that there was conclusive evidence that cannabinoids could be used for chronic pain. Um, number two, we're seeing at a, pop at a population epidemiologic level that states that enact medical cannabis programs see overall less opioid prescriptions and less opioid overdoses. And again, this is correlation, it doesn't imply causation, but it's certainly adding to the weight of evidence um, that this could actually be used to address the current opioid epidemic. And the third part is in very controlled laboratory settings, we see that uh, cannabinoids have opioid sparing properties. So if you add cannabinoids to um, opioids, you need significantly less opioids to achieve the same level of pain relief. Okay, so for all of these reasons, I think it's, it, it's critical that we investigate the potential of cannabis and the compounds within it to uh, act to both treat chronic pain as well as to for their opioid sparing properties to reduce the amount of opioids that people need to achieve the same level of pain relief. Do you see anyone else thinking in the same way as you on that? I'm sure there's other people out there who also want to do this kind of work. Um, so far, there has not been a longitudinal clinical study of the use of cannabis or cannabinoids in pain patients who are on opioids. Um, and that's work that I really want to prioritize and, and push through here at UCLA. Um, and, you know, part of the reason, again, going back to this is a large clinical trial like this, will take millions of dollars. And so it's really securing the funding to be able to pull off work like this. Where are we at this day today with regard to, you know, states and what they can do and what they can't do with cannabis, medical cannabis? In states that have medical cannabis laws, doctors still aren't really prescribing them because to prescribe something that has to mean that there's a standardized, uh, replicatable, high quality source that patients can go to get the medicine from that doesn't really exist. So rather than prescribing it, doctors um, recommend cannabis. Um, and there was actually a federal court case back in 2000 that reaffirmed the right of physicians to recommend, not prescribe, to recommend cannabis to patients in states that allowed it. And those physicians would be protected from any sort of uh, federal prosecution. And so, and then in states that have legalized medical cannabis, their state medical licensing board also recognizes the ability of physicians to recommend cannabis. Where it gets a little gray is um, typically physicians aren't allowed to necessarily recommend a particular brand or particular product, nor are they necessarily allowed to direct patients to a particular uh, store or dispensary 